What's up, Black Love fam and first time fam? Welcome to another edition of Man to Man, a part of the Black Love Podcast Network. I'm David Wazicki, General Manager of Black Love. And if you are a fan of Man to Man, the IG Live series, then you're going to love this convo today because this man was a fan favorite, favorite of mine. And it was all because he drop gems nonstop. <laughs> so I've got to rewind. I got to drop his stats again. He's a former NFL player turned therapist, speaker, author. And when we had our last conversation, he was getting ready to launch his new book, Identity Crisis. And in the brief time since, he's dropped another book slash journal, Just yeah. Heal Bro, which I can't wait to dive into. And I'm ready to dive into this conversation again with the one and only King J. Barnett. Man, how What's you up, doing, bro? David? It's good to be back, good, man. Good. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, it's good to be back, man. How you been? I've been good. I've been good. We've um, we've been having some great conversations here. As a matter of fact, we've been having great conversations and certifications where last week uh, we recorded with producer extraordinaire Benny Pugh. Uh, he's a music producer. And mm -hmm. there's this one question that he said after answering it, it made him man to man blue check certified. So of course, of course, I gotta get you blue check certified now. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, man. <laughs> it's so, funny because so, people are always like, dude, we gotta get you certified. My publishers, man, <laughs> been working on, I said, man, I got articles everywhere. You know, I, I even got an article with Black Love about men, yes, I think some years ago that, I, that I've done. And so uh, it, it's, you know, I'm like just recently did an interview with Black Enterprise. I'm like, man, what more do I have to do? I know so, you're out there. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, ho yeah, ho ho hopefully that, that gets me blue check certified, man. <laughs> well, we're going to get you man to man blue check certified right now yeah, with this absolutely. first question. So what does masculinity mean to you? Man, masculinity means to me uh, control. Uh, it means uh, management. It means humility. It means um, knowing how to be a lion and knowing how to be a lamb at the same time. I think there's a there's a fine balance in masculinity. Uh, masculinity is not in how uh, loud you roar. It's really in just the stillness of your presence that represents you being uh, masculine. And so that that's what masculinity means to me. It's not. It's not in my male parts. It's it's more in my functioning, you know, as a man, you know. So that's what masculinity mm. means to me. Well, that got you certified <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> David, man, when, listen, man. When, whenever we when, whenever we link up, man, like you, yeah. you bring it out of me, brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm the one. I'm glad I'm yeah. the key. Yeah, uh, man. <laughs> <laughs> So that was dope because, look, I've never had the same answer twice, mm -hmm. and that one was beautiful. And I yeah, love the lion and the lamb reference because yeah. I, I, I do feel that's what we have. You know, some can say a masculine, feminine energy, but I love this lion and lamb yeah. uh, context as well. Did that come from anywhere or – this again, well, I, I, well, I, I think when, when you look at uh, and not to make it biblical, but when you when you think sure. about David and you think about how he was uh, as a king and, and how he was as a warrior, he often spoke about the balancing. And that's one of the things that I've been able to do well for a lot of people is bring context from spirituality and mental health and psychology and, and connect all the dots. And what mm -hmm. he was saying in that context and being a lion and being a lamb he was really talking about balancing who he was as a man. You know, there's times when we have to stand up and we have to proclaim our uh, stance on things. But then there's times that we have to sit in silence and we have to be very strategic because oftentimes I think in moments of silence, it's an opportunity to really have uh, a, 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 a strategy, you know, planning, observation, reflection, introspective. And so I think... Mm. In masculinity, we often see it as being, you know, how strong a man is. But I think our real strength 
is even in our ability to control that, to being able to control our anger because anger is good. And I want to make sure I convey that anger is good. You can have, you know, a, a healthy place that anger drives from because let's be honest, great things have been built from anger. Now, you can't stay there because you can build from anger. You can build from sadness. You can build from fear. You can build from those things, right? And so I think, you know, when you begin to really operate in your masculinity, you understand how to hold all of those things that I don't have to be strong in everything. I don't have to show my strength physically. And sometimes my strength can be just shown in my support, in my presence that I'm here, you know. And so it's masculinity, man. I think it has a, a variation of different meanings based on the context in which a person is looking to really uh, 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 extract from what it is that they feel about a man, because I feel that as a man, I'm a provider, I'm a protector, I'm a priest, I'm a man of prayer, I'm also a prophet, you know, I'm a man that can see, that can visualize and visionary, I can manifest, you know what I mean? And I'm also a promoter, yeah. I can encourage, I can push forward. So in my mind, I see so many different variations of what masculinity is. And I think in that part, where we see people talk about the feminine energy part, it's also understanding that when you go back to the creation in the beginning, woman came from man. So in that, if she came from man, that means there's a part of us that possess, I'm not just going to say feminine energy, but we possess sensitivity as well. And I think most men are often trying to move away from that because they feel that if I express this sensitivity, how is my masculinity going to be viewed? Right? right. So that's right. always the fear. Am I going to be emasculated, you know, yeah. if I show this? But I think as you begin to grow as a man, you're able to 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 hold space for all of those different places as a man. Well, I think you've done an incredible job thus far and you show something on social media that I love and I'm a fan of. The weekly flower ritual yeah yeah man yeah and i i think that's a big i think that's a huge example of what you just spoke about being able to hold space for all of these different areas and uh being able to understand that and have the confidence and self-assurance that you're not losing your masculinity as traditionally defined right and more so what you're saying and i think the evolution and the progress in masculinity in understanding there are so many different dynamics to it. I think that in itself is one, again, beautiful thing. I've yet to see it anywhere else. So I love that uniqueness. And I think, again, that shows there is a different level of masculinity in that. And for you to be confident enough to say, here are my flowers. This is what I have for the week. This is for self. Mm -hmm. This is, um, um, what's the phrase loving on yourself mm -hmm. and, and, and really, really taking that in. Um, when, when did you start this process? When did you start this practice of well, flowers? I, I've always been into flowers. Uh, my grandmother, uh, loved flowers and she often, like I, I grew up in the country in Mississippi. And so we, we were surrounded by fields of sunflowers. You know, and um, she would pick sunflowers. She would pick all different type of flowers. And back then, they didn't have vases. They used mason jars. And so they would use mason jars, and she would put them in the window, and she would set them there. She would put her sweet potatoes in there, and she was growing all different types of things. And so I became very fascinated, you know, with flowers. And, and I've always loved sunflowers, man. When I was a kid, I would just run through the fields of Mississippi, man, just running through wow. sunflowers, right? Because they was, they had these big, long stalks, you know, when they would bloom, growing real tall. So you just, you know, you wanted to, to hide them. And I think uh, when my grandmother uh, passed, but she often talked, I was very close to my grandmother, and she often talked about not wanting flowers, you know, uh, uh, to be at her funeral because she, mm. she was big and wanting to smell her flowers while she was alive. And she would always say, give me my flowers. That was her song, yeah. man. Give me my flowers. Well, I guess, you know, she was singing this, <laughs> you know, this song, man. And, and I think when my grandmother passed, she often wrote, well, not often, but she wrote me a letter every month in college. And yeah. 
she would often tell me how her week was going and she would enclose a letter with a hundred dollars that she got from a social security and she would always tell me I was her favorite grandson. I don't, and she just, I don't know, cause she, it's, it's about 60 some grandkids that we have, but she just took a liking to me and because I really sat around her and I gleaned from her and I looked at a lot of things that my grandmother did and how she moved. She was very balanced. Um, she was a family woman, but she was huge in philanthropy. She was huge in politics. Like she took us to our first um, political rally. Mike Espy, you know, back then was running. Uh, I met yeah. Jesse Jackson as a kid. So my grandmother, yeah. man, she was this phenomenal woman. And when I started buying flowers, it reminded me of her and it reminded me of our connection. And I remember the first time I brought flowers in and I just started kind of, you know, putting them together. And when I had my girls program, I often took my girls flowers from a florist that I partnered with. And I would just go to the flower shop and just walk through, man, and just feel the life that these flowers gave. And so I started implementing that and bringing it into my home and bringing it into my own personal space. And it's been a game changer. And it's been amazing to hear the stories that men have sent me, you know, bro, I've been buying flowers you know, for myself, and it's changing my energy, because it, it's one thing to understand the, the, the life that flowers give, but it's another thing to embrace the, the life that flowers provide in your own personal yeah. space. Yes. That was beautiful, and I'm, I'm glad, and I'm very happy, one, that I asked that question, two, that you were able to share that, uh, which is, again, why you're a favorite of mine, because you're able to go there. And I, I feel like after that, what I kind of want to tap into is what you referenced earlier about channeling the anger, because you were a former NFL football player. So I'm sure you channeled that a lot on the field. Yeah. And there's that dichotomy, right? So there, there is this gentleness, there's the you know, tapping into the more sensitive side as you just expressed um, um, with that relationship with your grandmother. And then you also had this on the field, again, anger and and yeah. more of that testosterone and, and all of that balance. And I'm sure within all of this mix, from all of that, you know, I, I wonder, and I'm sure everybody listening wants to wonder, where did your your journey and this healing journey and this path come from? Because at this point in time, what we started off with, with the conversation, with the question and topic of masculinity, you kind of broke down all of the different areas that it can be. Right. And I'm sure, especially, I you know, I, I feel like I've mentioned this in, in previous conversations. I, I feel as though this is the era to change and re-examine what masculinity is. And I think you expressed it beautifully, but I want to rewind and understand how did you get to this point? So yeah. you're, you're telling, you know, you're also telling folks on your social and I'm sure when you're speaking that healing is a journey. So I'd, I'd love to just tap into that and just understand. Oh where yeah. Did it start? Yeah. I, I think for, I, I think a, a part of it started, man, and I didn't even know that it had started. Uh, my mother was big into skincare. She was big into taking care of yourself. I was the only boy. So, um, she was really big and like, Hey, take care of yourself, you know, make sure your, you know, your house is clean, your room is clean. You know, she was, she was really on that. And my father, my father, um, they, my family grew gardens. And so, uh, I, I would often see my father in the garden and, you know, uh, you know, we grew greens, sweet potatoes, watermelon. And so a lot of the things um, that I saw, I saw men doing them as well. And it wasn't necessarily always women. So I saw my father, like my father plants flowers and he's a phenomenal at it, man. So, and it's so crazy because he, he changes his flowers during the season. And so he plants certain flowers in the spring so I, I, I developed this, this passion for just, you know, the outdoors, but it wasn't normally from what I saw. Like my mother didn't cook. She cooked, but my father did a lot of the cooking. So a lot, of, and I didn't realize that a lot of these things that I was seeing, 
you know, were really changing my perception from a gender based, uh, you know, um, type of definition. Right. And I didn't really see it, man, until I entered into therapy because therapy Mm -hmm. allowed me to go down the road. Okay, tell me, what do you remember about your dad? What do you remember about your mom? You know, and these and these were moments where we were not recalling the bad that had happened from their divorce and, you know, just their uh, their relationship being unhealthy. It was more about recalling what things that you take from them, because it's easy to talk about what we don't like about our parents. But my therapist was pushing me to talk about what did I like? And so Hmm. part of my healing journey allowed me to lean into what I did get from my dad. You know, he has this love for flowers. You know, and he has this love for like beautifying his house. Like the man is like, he's phenomenal. Like this man was HGTV before that was HGTV, you know? (laughs) And so, and, and part of it, man, and that's why healing is a journey because you get to take this journey and you get to not only recall, but you also get to reflect because it's one thing to recall, but reflection is more like a deep uh, uh, inspection on, wow. That impacted me, and I didn't know that it was impacting me. And my mom began to embrace the things that I love about the both of them, but the deeper level of work is that I had to embrace it because I was living in a world as an athlete that that wasn't the norm. You know what I mean? I'm passing my poetry around and my short stories around in the locker room telling dudes to read this. And, yeah. you know what I'm saying, they like, yo, bro, what is this? And it wasn't <laughs> until, you know, a, a friend of mine, you know, had some issues with his girl. And so he was like, yo, man, can you write some? I'm trying to get her back. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so I, I wrote something, man. And, you know, it ended up, he was like, bro, man, it worked, dude. You know what I mean? Like, she took me back. And then everybody was like, man, dude, you hear Jay, man? He writes poetry and he writes all this deep stuff. And that's when I began to um, embrace it, but I didn't fully accept it. So healing allowed me to accept all the parts that I was rejecting based on how society viewed them. And that's the beauty of the journey is because, you know, I was afraid for years, man, David, to tell a woman that I like flowers. Because I ain't want her to think, you know what I'm saying? Like, yo, I ain't want her to think like, oh, you know, what you on? You know what I mean? That's weird. A man yeah, likes flowers. Yeah. And yeah. the therapy didn't release me to love flowers. Therapy allowed me to become okay with the fact that I like flowers. So that's the beauty in therapy and in healing. And, and I tell people, even me being a clinician, I don't provide answers. I give the space. So you can find context because I'm just a GPS. You're the driver. So I kind of give you direction on how to get to where you want to go. But you then develop that sense of awareness that, hey, whether the world likes this or not, I'm okay with me just liking it. And when I begin to be embrace that, man, I love flowers. Like the people know me at the store, right? You know, coming in every week. And at first, they were just like, hey, who are you buying all these flowers for? She must be a special <laughs> young lady. <laughs> and so, and I'm like, I said, I said, no, th- these are for me. And the lady was like, wow, you buy flowers every week? I said, yeah, you know, I have a budget for it every week. But here in Texas, Central Market have dollar roses every Tuesday. So, okay. you know, so, and then I, I understand the season of when peonies and sunflowers and daisies. So I, I have a understanding of what's in season and all those different things and it's just been man it's just been something beautiful to embrace my own masculinity within that space because I had my own ideas because I was questioning myself like yo am I supposed to like flowers because this you know again here I am with this societal standard hey that ain't what Mm -hmm. men do and like you said I think this is the perfect time and era for us to really debunk a lot of misguided information about who we are as human beings. And there's not this 
label and this definition on men do this, women do that. You know what I mean? And rather than know as a person, you do what is not only just model, but you do what's a part of your journey. So every time I buy flowers, there's this memory of my grandmother, Miss Willie B, right? So it's always this journey. And I literally tell my mom, well, grandma would love my flowers, man. Cause she would be, she, she called me Dr. J as a kid. That was all <laughs> nice. she called me. Dr. J, Dr. J. And I was just like, man, it, it, it's so, man, it, it, it's just been so liberating to walk into that space, David, of acceptance. And that's really what my desire is for men is to begin to exude unconditional acceptance toward themselves rather than looking mm. for it. Mm. Well, that phrase, unconditional acceptance, that's huge for me. That just, that gave me goosebumps. One, because of everything you just said prior, I can relate. So one, uh, just, just with your quick story and writing something beautiful to get the girlfriend back for your other teammate, it always takes the sensitive man to get that, <laughs> to get the right. woman back. Right, bro. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and, and I, felt, I feel that because that was me. You know, I was the sensitive dude, so I can totally relate to what you're saying and playing sports. And then, like you said, like a lot of what you just said really, really hit and, and ending it on this note of unconditional acceptance. I'm like, I wish there was this conversation and accessibility to this type of conversation. So, again, you know, that's why this is beautiful to me and especially you, because, again, you, you have that. Um, I guess I've said that word previously already, that dichotomy, you, you, you go to the, the ends and you can balance both now on this path, on this journey of healing, where you can get into that sensitivity, get those flowers unfazed, unfazed now. And you were able to get on that football field and take ownership of your stature and, and whatever right. those emotions were. And then you get off of it in, in the day-to-day -day world and you're able to say, this is Jay Barnett. This is who I am. This is what I represent. Right. And if you don't like it, yeah. so God bless you, but this is me. This is who I am. And as they say, I'm going to do me. Right, but exactly. getting to that point of I'm going to do me that's totally a journey. Yeah, it's and, a journey, man. And healing. And I think this is probably the perfect segue now to get into this journal because I'm excited to know what's in it. And I want to unpack what this journal is about titled just that, Just Heal, Bro. So it's yeah. out. It's available. One, give me the impetus. What made you want to? create this and two what 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 is this journal why will it lead us down this path of of healing so uh what what prompted this journal is early spring i began going back through my old journals man i've been journaling for years man for years mm -hmm. and man i probably have i mean i'm looking at probably two or three journals around here i was actually reading through one this morning and I put dates on my journals, like I put dates on things that I hear, things that are downloaded. And I remember being in a session, you know, um, with the therapist and actually working through some stuff from football and just going back and looking at that and, and, and really processing it. And I said to myself, that really got me into a space to being able to verbally express because I found my voice through journaling. And I said, what if men could find their voice just as I did? Because it's not, I don't believe it's second nature for us to be as expressive as women are. Because I think there's a certain level of confidence that comes with being able to express. But then there's also a certain level of stillness to be able to process what you're mm. thinking. Because many times yes. as men, I don't think that we don't uh, know what to say. We don't know how to say it. And so that takes another level of development in your thought process, right? How do you synthesize and how do you manage what you're feeling and what you're thinking in order, and for it to come out in a way so you can convey it effectively? And so what I said is I have to create something 
that takes them on a journey to allow them to be able to go through that process, right? Um, the book is 100 pages. I'm aware that men are not going to do as much as women, but man, in this 100 pages, it's packed with short stories and it's packed mm-hmm. with questions and it's packed with daily practices to get them in a habit to where you have to think. You just, it's, it's, it's open ending questions. You know, it's no yes or no. Do you like this? Yes or no? No, it's asking <laughs> questions where you have to go inside and go mm-hmm. back to that place and say, what happened to me that took me from being not confident in who I am? That's one of the things. What was the moment? What was the person? What was the event? What was the experience? Because I think what it does, it, it allows you to be introspective, right? Introspective. You now become an, ink, uh, an, 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 an inspector inwardly to where you begin to look within and say, what was that place that I first experienced hurt? What was that place that I first experienced rejection? What was that place that I first experienced abandonment? Because we don't just arrive at the place of inadequacy just because we're a black man. Somewhere along the line, who we were was rejected, and then we begin to question ourselves. And now as we question ourselves, we show up to the world looking for answers. But hopefully this journal takes men on the journey to begin to do their work and begin to process to where now they can show up to the world as an answer. They can show up to the world not with just a question. And so I think for me, that's what this journal has been. Um, I've been, I mean, it's, it's been flying off the shelf. People have just been like, you know, I'm actually doing several interviews with some NFL guys and so much stuff that we have planned because people are like, no one has ever created a journal for men. And and it's right. a dope journal. And man, you know, there's stories, um, um, there's a story in there called Violated, you know, from a story that I wrote from a kid who was molested and in the mm-hmm. church and he wasn't able to speak about it. And he now had to battle with his own masculinity and his sexuality at the same time. And so, and, and I am coming from a, ooh, man, it's my, my homeboy, we were in LA. <laughs> he said, so he reached the forward and he said, bro, I can't do this today, dog. He said, dude, <laughs> he said, I got to sit still to work through this. But he said, Jay, this is good because I think what this does is it gives men something to hold at their heart that where they can lock in to, oh, this is mine. You know, we saw that in movies with girls. You know, they would have their diaries and different things like yeah, that. Yeah. And the whole thing was like, my diary has a key. And I think this allows men to begin to express outwardly with the pen. Because there's something about when you put that pen to paper. Here's mine. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's something. It's, it's a, it, it hits different, man, when you put this pen Um, to paper and you begin to release Mm. and I want to help brothers to distance themselves from the experience and become more connected to their destiny to their future to who they desire to to become because what I discovered in, in and what I discovered in therapy was most of the thoughts that I had about myself they were not true but I made them true because of the belief system that I had attached for them, to, I mean, to them. So right. you have this experience, it happened, okay, you move past the experience, but what you believe about yourself from the experience is what goes with you. Right. right. And so I right. want brothers to begin, whether it's, you know, it, and there's so many things, man, that I've been able to help guys work through as a therapist and then just even through the interviews that I've done that are available on YouTube and from my book. It's just been um, it's just been so, so amazing, man, to help brothers find answers, you know, even with stuff with their dads, man. So it, it's just this mm-hmm. book. It was time and the, there was no better title that I can attach to it. Just heal, bro something light but it's a very powerful statement it is it is it's um well, yeah i love the title the, the first time i came across that title 
I said, that's it. That in itself, that's the calling card. That's like the call out to all men is just heal, bro. And when you get that, when you understand the simplicity, but the depth yes. in that phrase, it, it's powerful. Yeah, it's powerful. And that's what had me excited. The moment I saw it, I said, I have to talk to you about this journal, I have to get this journal. But I also have to talk to you about it. Because I felt there's there's got to be something unique in this beyond just the journal of it. And the beauty is that you are guiding. And some of these examples you brought up, I mean, some of these questions already had my mind racing and kind of going back to those moments and really pondering this as you're, as you were speaking about it. So I can, I can only imagine, and I'm only going to imagine for a short time because yeah. I will pick this up. Is it yeah. available? Yeah, it's available Amazon? on, on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. It's available okay. on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. So beautiful. And, and somebody beautiful. was like, Hey, somebody was like, Hey man, can you do, um, you know, they wanted me to do a sort of like a digital or ebook. I said, no, I want these guys to put pen, and uh, my barber hit me up, you know, uh, the other day. He said, man, Jay, he said, I literally had to go get some uh, brandy or some type of whiskey. He said, I really had to go get something <laughs> to drink, bro, to work through it. And he says, Jay, yeah. I didn't realize how much I was suppressing. Hmm. And think hmm. about that for a second, David. How many men are living in a suppressed state? When I talk about depression... I'm no, talking about no. a suppressed state Sup where you have suppressed so much that you are boiling over with stuff and you're just functioning on films. Your, your soul is tired. Your body is tired. Your mind is worn down because it's like, man, what do I do with my thoughts? What do I do with my feelings? Who can I just be, who can I who can I become unglued to, with, and not feel that I have to keep on the cape? And I think what's important is that brothers are going to find a safe space within this book where they can rest from their cape, right? And it's okay to, yeah. for us to be Superman. It's okay for us to feel like we can carry the load, but it's also important. For us to get into a place where we feel safe enough, let me take off this cape and not keep going. Because I think it's in the booth that Superman has this exchange with himself that says, yeah, you're leaping tall buildings with a single bound. You're faster than a speeding bullet. But man, in this booth, I need you to stabilize yourself as you enter and back into the world as Clark Kent. And many right. of us, man, we're looking for booths so we can just exchange yeah. and say, man, I don't want to be Superman today. I, I just want to be Jay. I don't want to be Jay the therapist. I don't want to be Jay the author, the speaker. I just want to be Jay. And I just want to be embraced for being Jay and know that right. I don't have to provide anything. And that's what I want brothers to really take away from this, man. Uh, let me just say, and I, I'm just going to be open here. All that you just said right now um, got me a little glassy eyed because I felt like you were speaking to me. I, you know, th this, this idea, <clears throat> and I'm choked up, this idea of suppression. Yeah, it's okay, brother. It's, it is something, it's something I deal with. This is one of my ongoing challenges is how much can I take on for everybody else? Mm -hmm. And where do I find time space a moment for myself uh it's 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 one thing that had me start meditating it's one thing that had me really appreciate uh training working out more mm -hmm. so but you know i i've had the on and off with journaling and when i've journaled it's been beautiful when i don't it's just a different experience. I'm not saying it's, you know, right, right. or wrong, but I will say it's better right? Uh, when, when you do do it. But again, go, just going back to all of that, I, I did 
feel like you were speaking to me and I'm hoping everyone listening to this, if they didn't feel it, I hope they at least appreciate and understand all that you said. Because again, for me, I mean, it resonates so much. And I, I feel there are a lot of men that suppress and it, it may not even be just in your day to day, or it may not be just as a black man, it may be all the things together, it may be something little, but that little suppressed over time just becomes bigger and bigger until you release it in an unhealthy way. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and I've, again, this is a journey healing, this yeah, healing yeah. is that a journey. And it is something I know I'm still on the journey. And I'm very fortunate to have these conversations again with, with brothers like yourself, to be able to get these different perspectives to be able to highlight things like this. And like I said, I just felt compelled, I want to share that as well, because you were speaking I know you're speaking with me directly right, with right. Me right now, but to me, you were speaking to me in that moment and I felt it. And I think it's, it's those times where if we allow ourselves as humans, but as men, especially to allow that feeling and emotion, I would hope that's a trigger for me. Right. Just so you know, what you just said is a trigger for me to move forward and really tap into that. And unsolicited, I am 100% getting this journal because I feel if these are the nuggets that are in there that are going to help me unpack this suppression, which I, again, I feel like that's my biggest challenge. Yeah. I, don't, I don't like saying problem and yeah. issues. That's my biggest challenge right yeah. now is that. Yeah. And I like that choice of word. And that's, and that's the word that I use with all of my clients. I never say issue. Hmm or disorder or anything like that. I always use the word challenge and I'm intentional about that because I want them to understand that they can overcome and that they can move beyond this. I think so many times when we don't feel that we can, we won't. And I think when you have the ability to move forward, then you can now operate and function in that. So, but you're right. It's just a challenge. It's something that you're working through. And, and I'll tell you, man, it's not easy um, to work through it because for so long, you know, I, I think even for us talking about mental health and talking about men's health and not just mm -hmm. from a physical uh, perspective, this is all relative new to uh, a lot of people. You know, I think it's even yeah. relative new to women because I've, I've heard just recently a woman says, well, oh, I didn't know men had standards. It's like, what? <laughs> Man, I kid you not, David. Oh, David. And here's the thing, David. <laughs> David, this was a 50-year-old woman who's wow. been married. And we just wow. we struck up the conversation. I was with my homeboy. We was out at this restaurant watching a game. And she, we got to talking. And she's like, oh, you men are different. Because my boys, my circle is aware, man. Like, we talk about things. Like, when something is going on with the other, like, we send voice texts, we send, you know, messages. And, and my, my guy said something, um, the lady, she's like, well, I'm just looking for a good man. And he said to her, he said, have you ever thought about who you are to the man and what he's looking for from you? And she was just like, what do you mean? And he says, well, I know you're talking about what you want from the man, but are you what this man needs? For the, are you the type of woman for the type of man that you want? And man, this lady's like, she was like, and he says, well, and she's like, well, I, I just, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm a good woman. But he said, what does that mean? And she began to just like freeze because you can tell a man hasn't asked her these questions before because, you know, to her defense, a lot of brothers don't go in depth. If I know that something is available and it may not require minimum effort, but if giving the minimum effort gives me the outcome I want, I'll give minimum effort. So why am I going to ask an in-depth question if I know I could take you on a few dates, take you on some trip, give you a little attention, and that gets me to the outcome that I want, right? But when right. he challenged her on this question, she now had to 
think not from the perspective of what she wanted from the man, but she also had to think considering the man. And many times, I'm going to say this, and people are probably going to come for me, and I'm cool with that. <laughs> many times, some women are not thinking about how the man feels in it because it's centered around what they want from it and not what they bring to it. Because if I go into it based off what I want, what you want doesn't matter to me. So many times I'm listening to couples in sessions that when a man begins to express his wants and needs, it's like, how, how could he want this? How, 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 you know, I thought sex was enough. And so I even said to this lady, I said, here is the thing. You, the, the world has said that all men need is sex. And I said, and I'm telling you, it's driven so many women away from seeing so much more within men. That we are more than just some beings walking around with a heart on and just looking for something yeah. to pose. It's deeper than yeah. that. Yeah. But then when she got challenged and she had to dig deep within herself, hello. And now you're challenged to, to, to come from a different place more than for what you present physically. And that's when she Absolutely. says, well, I didn't know men had standards. I said, and I said, this is why, this is my exact word, and I've already put this out here, you know, and I said to her, I said, this is why I'm going to have my own show one day, because I want to help the world see how men really function, and not from this whole superficial, like, no, there are some brothers out here that really have deep concerns about their emotions. Right. There's some brothers that make yep. good money that battles depression. There are some brothers that yep. are successful, that still have feelings of unworthiness that ain't yep. attached to the money. It's attached to what I've been told as a child. And so no matter how much money I make, I still feel unworthy because, see, they're, they're confident, but they're not one worthy. This is why you have guys who can perform great on the field leave the field and go out here and just do whatever, right? Well, I mean, yep. you take, you know, yep. these players, I'm not calling no names, but they were awesome players, but they go out here, you snort all the drugs, you sleep with all the women, all that. All of that's attached to unworthiness. Because, see, confidence is attached to what you can do and what you're good at. Worthiness is attached to being good at who you are. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah, I, I've never heard that before. That's <laughs> so. I told you, that's David. Another man. gem. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But yeah, man. Yeah. And so I, I really want men to be, and that's why I love you know. Anytime you reach out to me, man, you you know, brother, I'm always here. Any way I can push what you're doing, because I think it's so beautiful, man, that we're able to have these conversations, man. And I remember being in therapy, man, years ago and crying and just said, man, I just want somebody to understand me. Like, I remember saying, I just want somebody to understand me. Even, even my mother, as amazing a woman as she is, she didn't have an ear to understand because she was married to men who didn't know who they were. And here she has a son who's become self-aware. He's tapped to his, his emotions. I'm setting boundaries. She didn't understand me telling her no. She didn't understand how to process that. But she processes also from her own issues with rejection. Now my son is telling me no, and I can't call him at certain times. How could he do his mother like this? It had nothing to do with you being my mother. It had everything to do with what I needed in order to function. You know, I'm a firm believer, man, that uh, Mother Teresa said this, that God is a friend to stillness, solitude, and silence. And I want to say that again. Mother Teresa said, God is a friend to stillness, solitude, and silence. And that was the reason that I created boundaries for my mother. Because so many times, David, I needed my soul to catch up to my body. 
especially when I was on my healing journey. Because when you're going through healing, man, that's soul work too. You digging Absolutely. deep into some stuff, man. And your body is just kind of like, you know, ahead of itself. And you're trying to move forward in life, but your soul is like, no, 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 no. We need to process this. We need to sit longer. And so yeah. I had to work through all of that. Being my parents are pastors. You know, my dad said the other day, he was like, man, we don't know who you are. So, <laughs> so you know what I mean? So it's like my dad was a Baptist pastor. My mom was an uh, mm-hmm. a evangelist, a, a Pentecostal. So I got these dynamics working. So now I'm tying Jesus and therapy and psychology mm-hmm. and spirituality. But it's also helping them to make sense because here's what I didn't want. I didn't want people to just pray about it. I wanted people to understand what could they do about it. Mm, yeah. You know, because Christians, they use church just like a drug addict use drugs. <laughs> yeah, all facts, all facts. Yep. And they can add me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got I got family from that that whole dynamic that do just what you said in that way. <laughs> so maybe they'll at you too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and listen, I <laughs> I always love talking to you. I'm trying to be cognizant of your time. Um, we're doing a part three. And I think this part three is going to go into something you're working on. So I'm just going to say the title right now, but this is going to be the cliffhanger for part three, Jesus in Therapy. I know you were working on um, a series with that title uh, that I believe is out this month, but we need to get into just that yeah. in our part three, because I think there's so much to unpack. Ooh. And again, I can relate to so much yeah. <laughs> of what you just said in that phrase. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, man, I'm excited about it. And uh I look forward to unpacking it, man. I just think, you know, when I look back and and I think as I shared last time when I was on, I just look back at my journey and, you know, uh, 10 years ago, I, 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 you know, uh, survived my second suicide attempt. And when I look at where I'm at now, it all makes sense. And I was a guy who had so much pain, so much pain, so much anger. And I'm so grateful Um, to God, and I'm so grateful to myself that I trusted the process of going to get therapy and going to get help and to get understanding and to begin my journey because, to be honest, man, at the time, I was hurting my family as I was putting them through these, especially when you're struggling with suicide, ideation, man, it's up and down. Like, you may wake up today and say, today is the day. And you get through the day and then tomorrow's okay. You come back the next day. All right. You know, and, and people are like calling you on, like that was my life for a long period of time. And to get at a place where I have embraced what's been given to me and I've been able to embrace the mantle that has come with this, I think is even mm-hmm. more humility because now I see mm-hmm. how many people lives were attached to me surviving. And I just think about the men that have DM'd me from our first talk, from my breakfast club talk, from just so many things like they restored their relationship with their fathers. You know, men have stopped, you know, uh, several brothers have have reached out to me that they that they they were getting ready to take their lives. And they listen to, you know, a podcast that I've done. So, man, it's just so uh, it's such a blessing because I didn't realize that when I enter into school, uh, you know, six years ago, back in 2015, as a grad student, not knowing anything about mental health from the perspective as a uh, a mental health provider clinician, I only knew, hey, I'm a two-time suicide survivor, dealt with depression, I feel like this is where I'm supposed to be. I didn't know that God was setting me up to be a voice for this time. You know what I mean? Because... Yeah, yeah. He wasn't surprised by George Floyd. He wasn't surprised by the atrocities that was going to take place where the voice of a male would be needed for a time like this. 
And I just think what you're doing is so great, brother. I salute you. I affirm you because it takes a great deal of courage to step out and say that you're going to do something for men because we're still living in a world that is trying to remove the male influence, you know, right. by this quote unquote, right. you know, are there extreme of masculinity? But when you just get to pushing toxic masculinity, toxic, and again, there are some things that are toxic about masculinity as much as there are some things that are toxic about femininity as well. But my, my, and I want to close with this, we need each other. But I think this is a time where we can set aside our differences and really begin to give men the space to communicate however they communicate and just listen. So many boys that I work with that are clients of mine that said, Mr. J, I just want somebody just to listen to me and not try to, you know what I mean, uh, 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 tell me what they feel and what they think. Because this is, their, this is their experience often with their mothers. And guess what? This same experience impacts who they choose in marriage. And that's a whole nother conversation. That is, <laughs> you know, that is. because I'll get people to say, well, why are these black men choosing other races? And not because they don't love black women. It's because of their experience with their own mothers. And so I now have this resentment toward my mom that I'll choose another race because I don't want to experience the emasculation and the pressure that was placed upon me because many black moms have developed an emotional relationship with their sons because I am now placing my son in the position where my husband should be, but there's no man in the house. So my, my, so the son gets all of it. And most of these guys are just looking for a place to rest. Yeah. So I didn't mean to go on that tangent, but you know, <laughs> nah, brother, that look, clearly it had to be said. Uh, something moved you and clearly I bring it out of you and that's why we're doing a part three because we're going to bring more of these gems out of you yeah. uh, <laughs> and I love you for it um, look you do so much great work and you continue to do so and again very fortunate to have you uh, bring those th those great things to these conversations uh, I just want to make sure I don't miss anything with what what you have going on. So we touched about we touched on Just Heal Bro, available on Amazon. Please go get it now. I'm getting it. And we touched on uh, one project that should be out now, uh, Jesus in Therapy, which, again, we are going to dig into next time. And is there anything else that the people should know before we uh, man, that's that's it. I do have a few surprises, but I'm gonna let you know um okay. I'll be okay. I'll I'll be speaking at some different various platforms that are big and actually, you know, um so uh you know, just stay tuned. There's a lot of people that I'm working with in entertainment, uh and, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to just begin to provide language. You know, not yeah. just in this mental health space, but just in this healing space altogether, because, you know, black black people in general have been just existing with years of trauma. And I think now that we're able to get to a space. And as I told one, <laughs> this white guy, white, white lady said to me, well, Jay, you know, I just think, you know, uh, you guys just need to see more licensed therapies. And this and, and it was fixed. I said, no, it's not. I said. Black people were not giving the opportunity to heal. Hmm. We were not provided the space. And it's sad that the George Floyd and all of these other things currently over the past two years have taken place for you guys to acknowledge that, oh, maybe their mental health is impacted by these different, you know, events. Yeah, it's a lot yeah. of secondary trauma that we've had to endure. And you think about the 60s watching people get holes down with water holes and dogs biting them and all that. Man, that stuff is traumatizing because guess what? Those were our grandparents. Right, right. And here we are, the third generation of that. And our parents passed on that trauma from their parents. And now we're having to deal with the trauma of 
their issues and our own stuff in today's society in this social media and digital era. So it's a lot to work through. And so I, I just I'm just blessed, man, you know, to, to really have this opportunity to be on platforms like yours with Black Love to to bring language and insight. So thank you again, brother. Well, there's always a seat available for you to have this conversation. And I'm looking forward to the next one already. Uh, but in the meantime, again, thank you for making the time for the conversation. Yes, sir. And going going man to man with me today. Absolutely, brother. Uh, fam, you can follow my man King J Barnett at King J J A Y Barnett. That's with one N and two E, two T's, excuse me, on Instagram. And Please keep your eyes peeled for this man because he's doing amazing things. And in the meantime, make sure to tell another brother, king or queen about man to man so we can keep these conversations going and keep building each other up. And if there's someone you want to hear on man to man, connect with me on Instagram at Waziki, W-A-S-I-C-K-I, and I will do my best to make it happen and bring it to the people. Till next week, peace, love, and just heal, bro. <laughs> yeah, love it.